When I was in business, I had this amazing piece of advice that came from the custodian. I was working late one night on a project, and the custodian came by to grab the trash. And I, you know, charitably said, "Working hard or hardly working." He looked at me and smiled and gave me the best business advice I've ever had in my life. He said to me, "Working smart." And in, in respects of what we're talking about here, it's how do we work smarter to work on things that are of greater value and importance to us, as opposed to the toil and mistakes that we, we, we that are result in our process that we make today. Hi, this is Trisha Ratliff. Welcome to my innovation podcast. I'm talking to Roger Servi about automation on a budget, and more importantly, the outcome question: How can we accomplish more by working smarter rather than toiling? So good to talk to you, Roger. Welcome. Thank you, Trisha. It's always great to to speak with you. Yeah, same here. Everyone, I have brought Roger here this morning because. He leads the Dojo Consortium that we both participate in, and it's always a pleasure to talk to Roger and hear about the experiments that he's running and what he's learning. But Roger, by way of introduction, can you tell our listeners, what are some of the things that that are engaging you? What are some of the things that you're passionate about right now? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tricia. The things that are really on, on my mind, and I follow these things, um, obviously, immersive learning via the Dojo Consortium is a big uh, item of interest for me. It has been for the last four, five to six years. And prior to that, it was what got me into the immersive learning environment uh, was the DevOps practice, uh, which I've been interested in for the last 10 years, ever since I heard uh, Gene Kim talk about DevOps for the first time. It was like hearing the gospel. Uh, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but it was very moving and very informative. And you know, now as I continue that journey, my latest position uh, I've spent the last uh, 20 years in the telecommunications industry, and I'm currently working for a leading provider in the telecommunications space as a senior director. I'm challenged now with finding ways to to do the things I was used to doing at scale across a uh, you know Fortune 10 company. Now doing those things at a much more micro level and, and accomplishing them within a much tighter you know budgetary constraint and those kinds of things. So I, I remain passionate about finding ways to deploy you know DevOps into those little microcosms as well as finding ways to enable my developers with the best possible experience that will help them achieve the most they can, whether that's the highest degree of quality or the greatest amount of productivity. And and last but not least, but their fulfillment and excitement, their happiness uh, with their job. Yeah, those are a few of the things that I'm really keen on, especially the one late. Let's jump right in and talk about the company that you're working at now. Can you share a little bit about the environment there and, and what the culture is like? Yeah, I, I can't tell you how great I find the culture at my current employer. And for those curious, you feel free to look out on LinkedIn. I, as I mentioned, uh, I'm working you know, at a large telecommunications provider. Uh, we provide you know video, mobile phone, and, and um, excuse me, uh, internet services to our to our larger customer base. And then within that space, uh, my, my team specifically focuses on the creation of software for purpose that we then share uh, internally as well as externally for sale to other partners and, and communities. So uh, yeah, the name of that uh, that group is Innovar Solutions and they, they have been in business for the last uh, 20 years providing software solutions within the telecommunications market space to help customers achieve you know, amazing efficiencies through automation in the advertising space. It's been a, their the culture, I can't say enough good things about it. it. It reminds me of the best cultures that I've ever worked with. It's very people focused. Uh, it's it's very um, uplifting and supportive. They're very committed to initiatives that I'm passionate about, whether that's internally growing their, their own. Uh, I feel very pleased to be there as an outsider coming in, but they're very committed to internal growth and promotion, which I think is fantastic and, and a key to growth. They can take good care of their employees with amazing benefits. I think that overall, I find them to be very focused on the employees to make sure that they have the most amazing, you know, lifelong experience with the company that they can achieve. And uh, I definitely feel it's an employee first environment. I can't say enough kind things about it. Roger, that's great. And before we started recording, you mentioned it's a very entrepreneurial environment in that they're often working on a shoestring and making things happen. Did I hear yeah. you? 
No, that's right. Our particular SBU is a very lean, smaller organization within the greater fabric of the company that we're part of. And yeah, we're, we're constantly evaluating ways. I talked about, you know, what I used to do at scale and now trying to accomplish that within a more uh, micro, uh, micro oriented environment that's, that's lean and focused on, on one particular outcome, as opposed to a more broad spectrum of of different needs and capabilities. So we have developers who are involved in the creation of our software product and they are, you know, they are currently, uh, you know, type, typing away, creating new code for, to support these amazing products that we're putting out in the marketplace to help our customers. And we, we spend, you know, the better part of our intake, you know, our employees to ensure that those products are amazing. And when it comes to finding new ways to implement DevOps. We are committed to that, but at the same time, every investment they make is humble and and modest according to our, and consistent with our budgets. And, you know, that takes a lot of thought and calculation on my part, as well as on the part of my leadership to try and make sure that every dollar, you know, achieves the maximum impact possible where I've come from in the past. and, And even at our current company, it's you know, you have these amazingly large implementations of DevOps tools and, and tools like Jira and Jenkins, et cetera. They operate, they run, they, they host, et cetera. As a smaller company, we've got to rely on a different set of tools that are being delivered through managed services. While I might not be picking tools that I, I'm, I thought originally were best practice, now they're, the definition of that best practice is do they fit our, our continuum and our cost thresholds, as opposed to are they necessarily the best, the most well adopted, et cetera, platforms? And what are the results that we can achieve with these things uh, that are consistent? So relying heavily on managed services now has been a key part of the, the strategy shift for, for us to try and help our developers realize you know, amazing potential. We find that there are key providers to us that we've had long relationships with that are that have expanded their reach in terms of their product coverage in the uh, developer space. And we're constantly reaching out to them due to the simplicity as well as the elegance of the products and solutions that they're offering in such an integrated fashion that makes it so, so simple to, to implement and to, to turn up within your development space. Thanks, Roger. Is the team that you're working with primarily a software product development team? Yeah, so we we run and operate the solutions on behalf of our clients. So we have most of our staff dedicated to the development component. Uh, we do have certain responsibility for the infrastructure for the um, correct operation and support of the environments that we um, that we provide to our customers on a software layer. While we don't have direct responsibility for the actual servers, it's hard to separate the operation of your software solution from the components of the server that are behind it. So we cross over quite a bit and recognize that relationship and partner with our clients to take care of that infrastructure piece. So all of our developers are full stack. So while I do have some who are better in the infrastructure area than others, we do take care of the entire solution with people who are, who are generalized across a, a full stack, whether that's the front end, the back end, or the infrastructure components or the code that we need to take care of for our uh, operations. As I said, our, our software is available uh, to run directly in our, our customers' environments. In addition, we're, we're starting to make to work on other solutions that are SaaS-based that we hope to take to market in the future that will help lower the threshold of allowing customers to enter. And uh, that's going to require even more infrastructure operation for my team. So we'll be an expertise okay. in that area as well. Roger, I'm sure that our listeners can relate to needing to work fast, get a lot done on a shoestring. Are you comfortable sharing specifics about tooling, maybe some experiments that they've run that have failed, but then later succeeded? Absolutely. One of the things that I did when I originally joined the company, I was asked to help mature the software practices at the company and eventually realize in terms of greater productivity, improved quality, and you know, improved job satisfaction for our, our team. Originally, I took aim at in implementing you know the basics that I find within DevOps that are most contributory to those practices. As we started looking across the landscape, I wanted to in- inject things that you try and get established when you're setting up DevOps, and some of those were already in place, and most of them were not. As I started to think about experiments, I said, okay, we need to start injecting linting within to our code processes. We need to start doing unit tests. All the basics that you find within a software development practice, 
as we started looking at tools to start enabling our continuous integration, we, we were looking at things that I was comfortable with. And so we started getting Jenkins set up and we talked about it for a while. And we said, wouldn't it be cool to use some of these tools that are available from our other components? And I, I've had a lot of experience with Jenkins. I know it's common in the marketplace. It seems to be one of the best practices. It conforms to one of the requirements we have, which is it's an open source product. So, or you can buy support as you need it. It's also relatively well adopted across the base of our parent company. And so it seemed like a good fit. We stood it up, we started playing with it. And sure enough, my developers got busy doing other things for projects that needed to be delivered to our clients. And, you know, we never really made the kind of impact with it that I hoped to. And that replicated across multiple areas where we were trying to implement things. We were standing up SonarQ and getting that linting done to support our CI. We liked the way it performs. I like the way it performs, but ultimately it became, again, another support item for us and one that was getting deprecated because it wasn't being properly maintained in much the same way, you know, Jenkins wasn't properly being maintained. And as I continued to look at it, you know, we went on and said, okay, let's solve the issues thing. And so, you know, how do we record our, our requirements and our, our development work and the tasks and integrate those with collection of, of defects. And we started to work with JIRA and we were, we, you know, within the framework that we had, it was hard to integrate some of the tools that we had and we were, it was difficult to enable it and do all the things we wanted to. And so we're looking at just literally intention after intention to put these tools in place and each one of them coming up short of what I knew that they could produce relative to their impact and attributable mostly to the same root cause, which was we don't have enough manpower to take away from the work that we're doing on behalf of our clients, which we're contracted to provide, to run and operate these things. More than that, we needed more flexibility sometimes than we were able to achieve by utilizing the tools that were available from our parent company. And so we made decisions that extended the relationship we had into areas where I, I had previously thought was, was not so positive, but, but I've changed my mind about that. I've always been a results person. And I try not to be too convicted about it's got to be this tool or it's got to be this product or what have you. The result is what counts. And I'm up that same way in terms of methods. And as we looked at the tools, we found that there were tools that we could get from you know, our provider, um, in this particular case, GitHub, although there are other providers in the software repository space that also have services, but GitHub specifically helped us automate our CI by utilizing GitHub Actions. GitHub helped us automate our linting by utilizing some of their security and linting services that are resident within the code where my developers are already operating and checking in and doing pull requests now, which is another uh, item that we put in place, mandatory code review. And all of a sudden the wheel started to spin and it started to spin just a little faster and a little faster. And now we're, we're moving into the project space that's available in GitHub by storing all of our backlog issues there all of the work that we designed to build out our products. And we we now manage that. And the experience that we're hearing from our delivery team is, is really positive. They, they love it. We we really, as a development team, are loving it. And all of a sudden, I find that I'm utilizing one integrated or a very small number of tools that are highly integrated and provided from one provider. When I never thought that that would be the case, I thought I'd be operating my own and the best practice tools and just doing it the way I did. And I had to throw that playbook out and start with something different. And start modeling off of being able to take on managed services that were readily and, and within my, my grasp. We had a relationship with GitHub. It was not a big deal to extend that relationship. And, you know, same is true for other tools as well. And as we continue to move forward in our, in our maturity model, we're going to be conquering more of the test automation space next. And we are, we are again, looking at the same kind of tools uh, that will give us both the test cases, the, the automated runs, the no code, test case generation, et cetera, and trying to look at the most positive, widest range of managed service providers in that space. Again, because if we are, if we're trying to run it and operate it, we're competing against ourselves for our own capacity. And that's, that's always going to be a losing proposition for the internal initiative. Uh, using external resources in a managed context helps us amplify and, and multiply the manpower effects uh, and capabilities that we have as a team. So yeah, we've had a really positive experience so far and that, that experience continues to grow. Thank you, Roger. That was a really great example of partnering with your managed services providers. You're the second person that I've talked to this week that's mentioned that. Awesome. It's good to hear that. <laughs> good ideas are like a cold. I guess everybody gets it eventually. 
Yeah. The idea is that we we collaborate inside our organizations, but if we can look for opportunities to productively collaborate with those who are trying to serve us, of course, that's very agile, isn't it? I totally agree. <laughs> so you mentioned that you're looking into your automated testing. Are you saying that you're already doing automated testing and you're looking into improving it? Go ahead. Yeah, we are using uh, automated testing and we want to continue to expand that. Our test coverage numbers are still pretty low. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you rely on often over much is what you've done in the past. And, uh, you know, manual testing has been a part of that. It's helped keep our quality high. Our customers are happy. But if we're going to continue to to grow, we, we've got to start let, and, and, and move up the value chain for those people doing that work. We've got to start employing more uh, automated testing, which will allow us to shift left. We've built up a, a good amount of unit tests and we're continuing to add to that on a daily basis. Even the tools that we're buying are starting to help us write unit tests and Copilot from GitHub, for example, is letting us try that out as well. And we're really excited about that experiment so far. But that only is part of that automated testing area. We're adding those unit tests into our builds and we're looking at running those as we do our check-ins and our PRs to see how the code is working. And now we wanna extend that uh, into the integrated test space where we do have some automated tests, smoke tests at the moment, but we want to really blow that up and you know start do, delivering that with each, each and every feature. So that as and when we're running and, and deploying, we're actually seeing those uh, test cases that we've been running amplify and make them as cost-effective as possible, not only to run, but to inject into the development process in traditional DevOps fashion to shift the, de the defects left where they're cheapest. I did a study once a long time ago at my last employer where we collaborated with six or seven other Fortune 500 companies to come up with a, a standard in a consortium fashion uh, around the tool Hygieia at the time of what a defect cost. And the number that was come up with was $775 for each defect that went to production that had to be corrected with a production release. And when you look at that, that kind of impact of one defect, that amount, it becomes easy to clarify what the, what the impact of, of, of improving your quality standards are. If I could just eliminate 20% of my defects or 10% of my defects with this thing I'm doing on automations, here's the value to the company it would achieve. It would, it would save us in terms, and, and not just save us, but there's the, you know, the expected uh, return that it produces in terms of a positive experience for your customers, which is even harder to put a value towards. And even if you left that off the table, the number on the cost side is very compelling. And that's what all the companies who participated in that uh, particular um, effort found was that, you know, utilizing this metric helped us justify the work that we were doing and the investments that we were making in, a, in such a positive way um, that there was an irrefutable argument in favor of utilizing test automation within the development frameworks to generate mm -hmm. improvement at a capital level for your teams. Uh, and not only that, developers hate messing around with bugs anyway. So it keeps them in a happy, yeah. healthy place as well. Yeah. Do you remember the name of that report for the listeners who want to look it up because they're working on justifying the investment in automated testing? So I, I don't remember the, the name of the report, but there is a talk that was given by myself and Dr. Taparbata Paul, uh, where we explain some of that logic in a presentation on Hygieia. The consortium of companies that came together were all working at that time around uh, publishing Hygieia. Uh, the three of those participants are in that talk. So if you Google Topo Paul Roger Servi, T-O-P-O -O space P-A-L, uh, he's the father of Hygieia and you Google my name, you'll find a talk that occurred in 2018. And we walked through the formula on how we came up with the numbers and there's a, it's a video and you can, you can pick it up from there. In the time that we have remaining, is there, are there any other topics that you feel like you you know you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, very happy to do that. So one of the areas that my developers are excited about, you know, I took a look at the, some of the things that we were doing, and I just was staring at my you know my roadmap of of improvements that I'm trying to implement, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, I just I need something that's a win. I need something that moves the needle. I need something. I need something. Right. I can't get any more developers, and we're we're maxed out on you know, how many developers we can have at the moment. Uh, and, and I have a good number, so it's not that I'm, you know, uh, crying poor at this time, quite the opposite. But how do I get even more impact, even more results from the people that I have? 
And we started talking about what are the things that we're doing? Where do we spend our time? And we didn't come across anything that we could eliminate uh, within the current you know, operations and tool sets that we had that wasn't already on our roadmap and we knew that we needed to be doing, for example, you know, taking out the, the bugs in the development process and improving our quality there would definitely help us in the support category, right? We wouldn't have, our, our team also provides the support for our software that when our customers and or our delivery team point out errors. Uh, so we knew those sort of things, but one that kept nagging at us and I've heard a lot about in the industry are some of these amazing uh, generative AI programs that are out there trying to write code. We were talking amongst the developers about, you know, can could we leverage a tool, you know, like Open AI or Copilot or something along those lines to help our developers accomplish more? And then it got to the point where what what could we what would happen if we were able to just find a way to not type in the amount of code that was worth five percent? And so if I'm gonna produce ten thousand lines of code, what would happen if five percent of that ten thousand lines were generated for me at a click of a button? We could produce, you know, nearly a full person's worth of output in an automated fashion if we had the right tool that worked, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the experiments that we're currently managing now uh, is to utilize generative AI tools to help amplify our current developers. And I, I use the word amplify as opposed to automate because I, I really want to be clear. There is no tool in this space that we've seen so far that is that is perfect and good. It is all at the imaginary discretion of the user uh, to come up with a, a verbalized command that will allow code to be generated in a useful fashion. But also it takes a true professional who understands what they're doing to avoid the generative AI's uh, cut, copy, paste coding uh, errors and make that code consistent with the quality processes that, and, and standards that we have in place and to adapt it, if you will, to our needs. And so the experiment we're right now we're running, uh, which we're really excited about, and is likely to lead for our, to our teams fully adopting uh, GitHub Copilot program. We're seeing the impact already. We're seeing, you know, a five percent bump in the amount of code that's that's being generated. There are more developers utilizing those kinds of tools, and the three who are I'm measuring in my pilot right now, they're on. Uh, company licenses, the others are on personal licenses. And just to show how, how excited we are about these sort of things, you know, we keep tallies of how many times the application helps them, et cetera. And we reply back to GitHub with feedback on where we're finding things and how how we think it could be better, et cetera. And we've seen some new features come, come out that, that address some of our concerns. And we're really excited to be part of that development community, that process that's coming forward. And I truly believe that the work that we're doing in this experiment is going to yield amazing benefits that will continue to push the needle forward. But not only that, you might say, oh, 5%, that's nothing. Apply that against a company, you know, with 100 developers, 1,000 developers, 10,000 developers. It's it, it, The impact there becomes astronomical in terms of the output improvement that you're seeing. But it's not just the output. I think my developers are happier as a result of using it because it's reducing the toil that they normally would engage in. The mindset improvement for them uh, and how they feel about their job uh, and they're they're tinkering. All of the developers that I've ever known, the engineers who are out there coding, they're problem solvers, and they love to try new things, and they love to experiment. And the experiment they're running right now challenges them mentally in a way that they've never had before, because they realize that this thing could could simplify their their life and take away things that they'd rather not do. Now they're they're in this space where you know they're able to you know accomplish more, but they're challenging themselves mentally to figure out how can I leverage this thing? How can I explain what it is mm -hmm. that I want? This yeah. new way that's going to you know bring this forward. It's fantastic. And they're having such a, a good time with it. It's, it's truly remarkable. There is so much hidden savings in there, Roger, for every, every developer who's passionate about their job, not distracted about what else they might be doing or how frustrated they are. The cost of losing an experienced developer and replacing that person, you've just removed that cost as well. So there's probably a lot of hidden benefit in there that's obvious to you, but may not be easily measurable. Would you agree? I, I couldn't agree with you more. You're so right. The developers that we recruit at, at Innovar, we try to make sure that our we tend to recruit senior developers as opposed to more fresher. Now we are evaluating that and trying to evolve that just a little bit as we continue to grow and expand, uh, filling at the bottom. But our, our current group of people have very specialized skills 
finding them is extremely expensive. Keeping them is, is far cheaper than finding them, for example. And anything that we can do that will help them feel like they're in an environment where they're advantaged, where they're excited, where they're interested, helps keep them from you know checking out. When people are are happy about their job, they tend to be you know in that place for a while. Um, you know, I, I saw a study once that said people most often tend to leave their job not because of, of necessarily the, the work that they're doing, but because of the management team. And I hope that when our developers see that our management team is interested and in, and excited about sponsoring these kinds of uh, experiments that are good both for the company as well as tremendously good for the staff that they they say they're in the right place and they're with the right leaders and that these leaders are concerned and care about them and that they they start to develop you know the needed safety around the perception they have of their leadership that they can continue to bring forward new ideas new thoughts uh, that contribute to the innovation that that our company uh, is famous for Roger, there's so much there. I'm glad this was recorded so our listeners can go back and listen to that list of all the attributes that are necessary for that healthy, productive, high-performing environment. I'd love to have you back sometime in the future to discuss culture. That would be fantastic. I would love to talk about culture. It's one of my favorite things. Great. Yes. All right. Well, Roger, we're, we've come to the end of our time together. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing about your organization and the steps that you're taking. Thanks very much for having me, Tricia. It's been a blast. I, I look forward to the next time. You're welcome, of course.